Hi, I'm Larry Gifford. I have Parkinson's disease. This is when life gives you Parkinson's. But did life give it to me? Or did I do it to myself? Where does Parkinson's come from anyway? How did I get it? Joining me on this podcast journey is reporter and producer Nikki Reitmeyer. Hey, Larry. You know, that's a good question. How did you get Parkinson's? Oh, the million dollar question, Nikki. It's, uh, I've been asking myself that since the day I was diagnosed. Uh, technically, Parkinson's is caused by the loss of nerve cells in the deepest, darkest part of the brain called the substantia niagara. Okay, but why you and not me if we both have that same part to our brains? Let's go through why people get Parkinson's and sort of who's more inclined to get Parkinson's. I'm a guy. I'm a male. Men are more likely to get Parkinson's than females okay. or women. Uh, so, uh, also age plays a role. I'm older than you are. I'm okay. not quite old, old. No, like you're you, still young. But you know, you're younger, okay. so you, it's less likely for you. Uh, only 10% of people are diagnosed under 60. Oh, including yourself. Including me. Um, I've talked to family and friends and experts and myself <laughs> about this. <laughs> uh, my mom wonders if something happened at my birth. You were born... Not breathing, because you were born chin first instead of head first. And so the doctor had to give you mouth to mouth, and you did not breathe for less than a minute when you started breathing. And they had us watch you when you were little, and everything seemed to be okay, but I've always wondered if maybe that didn't do something to one little part of your brain. Geez, that must have been really scary for your mom. Yeah, I don't remember it, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, for sure. Like anytime like your baby's not breathing when it comes out, that's a problem. That's super scary stuff, yeah. Yeah, so genet- genetics can play a role. Uh, in my case, there's no family history. Uh, but if you have a parent or a sibling that has it, the odds are increased that you'll get it too. Uh, in season one of the pod, I participated in the Parkinson's research project over at the, the University of British Columbia and had my full genome mapped in search of genetic connections. And Dr. Matt Ferrer, who was on the team that found the first genetic connection to Parkinson's, sat me down to share my results. How abnormal am I? <laughs> Well, genetically speaking, I think uh, we've all got interesting findings, right? And that's yeah. a nice way to couch it. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. Um, seriously, there's a, there's there's as many genetic variants as there are stars in the sky, kind of thing. And and uh, it takes a lot of time to look through it all and, and uh, assess it. For known genes, there's not that many known genes. There's about seventy or so involved in Parkinsonism. You're totally wild type, which means normal, right? Um, I've been called worse. Yeah. <laughs> wild type's pretty good. And, uh, and I went one further and I looked in genes that have been linked or associated with, uh, with neurodegeneration, because um, that's Parkinson's one form of that. And, and, uh, and again, um, there's nothing anomalous. Okay, so you're a man and maybe something happened at birth, but... As we heard the doctor say, your results were normal for somebody with PD. So he, he also told me he goes unremarkable. Unremarkable. <laughs> I'm like, geez, that's almost an insult. <laughs> 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 and you don't have any genes associated with Parkinson's, at least, at least not among the seventy or so that have been discovered. So. I guess we can't really rule that out. No, because there's more that are being discovered every day, every year. I mean, so Dr. Farrer has told me there could be 500, there could be 1,000. We don't know. Right. So, But my genome won't change, so they can run that any time. And and as new data comes in, it'll fill that out. Oh, interesting. You are a part of this living, breathing research. Yeah. Right right now, researchers all over the world are trying to find clues and follow up on hunches about, you know— why people get PD, you know, help people like me discover the the root cause of, you know, why me. Um, and, uh, you know, they're hoping to figure that out so they can halt it. People are like, well, right. I do want to know how you got it. I'm like, well, if you can figure out how you got it, you might be able to contain it before it onsets. Well, and then you might be able to prevent other people from getting it if we know what's causing it. Correct. So that 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 would be exciting. Uh, when I was at the, the Michael J. Fox Foundation's Parkinson's IQ Plus U in Southern California, I sat down with Sohini Chowdhury, 
deputy CEO of the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Now, the foundation's goal is and has been to find a cure for Parkinson's and then close its doors. And this marks the foundation's 20th year in operation. They've raised a billion dollars for Whoa, Parkinson's research. A billion with a B. With a B. Jeez. So I asked what research is underway right now that is really exciting to her. The synuclein studies that are going on, um, partly because the scientific rationale is so strong. We know that alpha-synuclein, this protein that exists in all of us, but for some reason it clumps with Parkinson's patients, we know that it's the hallmark of the disease. And so the fact that we actually have a number of different therapies in clinical testing that are looking to target alpha-synuclein is incredibly exciting because it really gets to this root biological process that we know is part of the disease. Right. And so from my understanding, it's kind of like what we're seeing after the forest fire has burned is we're like, hey, there's alpha synuclein there. We just don't know how it got there or why it's there or what it did. Exactly. We know that it's there. Did it cause the fire? Is it, be, did it, is it a consequence of the fire? Maybe it's totally irrelevant to the fire and there are two processes going on. We don't know. But what we do know is that when you do an autopsy on um, the brains of individuals who have had Parkinson's, we know that they have Lewy bodies, these clumping, what we call the clumping of alpha synuclein, we know they have these clumps in their brains. And so the theory is let's go after these clumps because they exist and they don't exist in the brains of individuals who don't have Parkinson's disease. It's an alpha synuclein mystery. Yeah. <laughs> clumps and clumps of alpha synuclein. <laughs> what about those clumps? Uh, well, you know, the, those Lewy bodies uh, are found in parts of the brain that affect sleep and sense of smell, which could help explain why so many symptoms of Parkinson's are not related to movement. That's kind of a, they call it a movement disorder, but there's so many things that have nothing to do with movement. Uh, so alpha synuclein can play into this. We just aren't sure how. Okay. So... Adding alpha-synuclein into the list of problems at birth, you're a man, and the possibility of yet-to-be-discovered Parkinson's genes. In the Muhammad Ali episode back in December of 2019, you talked about how some people get Parkinson's from blows to the head. Right. Now, boxers, football players, martial artists, rugby players, ice hockey players, flax to the head can cause pugilistic Parkinson's. And I talked to Dr. Jeff Bronstein, the head of the Movement Disorder Clinic at UCLA, about that. Severe head trauma, yes, it turns into what's called CTE, chronic right. traumatic encephalopathy, the things you hear about football players. But, you know, there's a tilt. There's similarities in all these diseases or aggregations of proteins. So depending on what other risk factors you have, head trauma may turn you into CTE and have more dementia, or it may turn into uh, to Parkinson's. And it all it, it's a whole cascade of events. And it's almost like you're at a, a fork in the road at some places, and one may tilt you one way toward CTE, and one may tilt you to the Parkinson's disease. Okay, that's a lot of really technical stuff. It is. And I've got more for you, too. Oh, God. No. <laughs> so get ready. <laughs> okay, let's, okay. Let's pull out the chart. Okay, I'll concentrate. Uh, I'm going to tell you about a study from 2018. Mm-hmm. Uh, 111 brains of deceased football players. The study found 110 of the 111 brains had signs of degenerative brain disease. Whoa. So almost all of the brains they looked at from football players, had signs of degenerative brain disease. Right. And this was a group from Boston University School of Medicine. That same year, these researchers, along with the VA Boston Healthcare System, published an article in the Journal of Neuropathology and Experimental Neurology that contact sport participants may face an increased risk of Lewy body disease, which can trigger Parkinson's. They studied, ultimately, 694 brains including 269 from former athletes as part of this long-running CTE study. Now, people who participated more than eight years were at the greatest risk of getting Parkinson's. Interesting. So it's not just the sport you play, but it's how long you're playing it as well. Right, which is, you know, whew, yikes. Yeah, but how about for yourself? Did you play? I mean, I know that you grew up in the States, and varsity football is very, very popular. Did you play any varsity football, any football in high school, elementary school when you were young? No. 
No contact sports. Uh, well, so I was a pee wee football player for a year, but rode the bench uh, with medical <laughs> issues that had nothing to do with football. Like I, I was accident prone and right. not very coordinated, as you might remember my mom saying. So, uh, you no, know, uh, kind of like uh, uh, exercise, athletics were uh, were a challenge for me. Right, you were a bench warmer. I I knew how to warm a bench like nobody's <laughs> business. <laughs> okay, so no big jolts to the head. No, no big jolts. Well, I do remember uh, I had one big jolt to the head. Oh. So there was a big snowfall one year, and the snow was piled high along the side of the driveway, like five feet tall, and it looked so light and fluffy. And I thought, oh, I, can, I bet I could dive into there like a swimming pool. So I, I did a running headfirst jump into this pile <gasps> of snow that was just ice. Oh. Oh, and that hurt. That jarred my head and my neck. And uh, But, you know, I never went to the doctor or anything. I was more embarrassed than anything else. But I do remember that. I wonder if that maybe caused a concussion at yeah, all. Yeah, but it's not like over the course of eight years. I didn't do it every yeah. year. I just, yeah, I learned my lesson. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So let's continue to check things off our list here. Okay. You're a male. I am. But you have no family history Correct. of PD. Uh, no genetic markers that they've thus far discovered. True. You didn't play any high-contact sports. Right. So what the heck else could possibly be going on here? Well, another area that we should examine is uh, environmental factors. So, uh, for instance, exposure to insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, certain metals and chemicals used in factories or like war chemicals like Agent Orange. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, By environment... You don't mean so much like global warming. No. You mean more where you live, what do you do for work, what do you do socially, have you been in the military, Correct. that kind of stuff. Yeah, at least that's what the researchers are suspecting is that, that the, the, those environmental factors could play an issue. Dr. Bronstein, who we heard from earlier, uh, works closely with Dr. Bieta Ritz, professor of epidemiology at the Fielding School of Public Health at UCLA. I, I'm a population researcher, meaning I actually try to figure out whether whether people who get Parkinson's get it from one or another kind of uh, cause. So we're trying to actually prevent Parkinson's in the end, if we ever find out what all the causes are, right? Okay, so let's keep going through this list then, because you weren't in the military or, like, exposed to Agent Orange. No, no. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that... We know each other, and we work together, and we do not work in a factory. No, we do crank out a lot of news, but we do not work in a factory. (laughs) And I don't think you've ever worked in a factory? No, no. Did you ever live near a chemical plant? I did not. So when else could you have come in contact with a lot of chemicals? Well, you know... Uh, as a kid, there's a lot of mosquitoes when you're playing outside in the summer. So we used to spray off oh, all yeah, over of ourselves, course. like in our face. Close your eyes. <laughs> you remember that taste? Uh, oh, and, I can taste it now. Oh yeah, and then they they sprayed our grass every week with this from this company called Chem Lawn. Oh, just a nice chemical no, spray chemical on your sp- lawn. Yeah, that I used to roll around in, and it used to smell oh. funny, and like you could see it like on the tops of the grass, and yeah. So there was that, uh, and a lot of cities in. North America, you know, they spray plumes of chemicals down the street to control the mosquitoes. Right. Yeah. Uh, so pesticides are are really suspect, especially according to Dr. Ritz. My big research project has always been around pesticide use and uh, professional as well as house, household pesticide use and how certain pesticides are really neurotoxic. And some pesticides are neurotoxic in a way that we think that it causes Parkinson's disease when you're exposed over a very long time or at very high levels. You know, I think this conversation and what Dr. Ritz is saying is so interesting because there's probably a whole list of health problems that we could trace back to pesticides. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've heard a lot about the dangers of pesticides over the years, but not never sure how it linked to Parkinson's. So I I asked Dr. Ritz and Dr. Bronstein why they believe pesticides could be a trigger. Pesticide was a hypothesis that came out of the MPTP story where we had instantaneous young onset Parkinson's due to a contaminant in a synthetic heroin that was injected in California. And this MPTP looked... 
kind of similar to a uh, pesticide, herbicide actually, that's called Paraquat. So the chemical structure was so close that uh, chemists freaked out saying, well, you know, if one thing does it, maybe the other does it too. Uh, Paraquat is slightly different, but it looks like in animal models, not in every animal, but in certain animals, it does cause Parkinson's-like phenotypes uh, but we in the meantime learned that there's a lot more neurotoxic um, uh, pesticides insecticides out there than just this paraquat and it, it makes sense because we are trying to kill insects by uh, disturbing the nervous system right so we are actually using actively using neurotoxins in the environment to kill animals that have a brain and a nervous system and that's how we do it. So when I sprayed off all over myself growing up as a kid to get the mosquitoes right. away. It's probably not a good thing for you. Yes. But I think the risk, every Parkinson patient gets it for a different reason. It's, I, I think of it as um, a humongous Venn diagram where there are many, many different risk factors, including genetic risk factors. Some of the genetic risk factors don't do anything unless you're exposed to certain environmental toxins. So not everybody who's exposed to Paraquat gets Parkinson's only if you maybe if you have a certain genetic background we call that gene environment interaction and so if you add up all these different risk factors whether it's head trauma uh, your diet uh, pesticides and your genetic background you add it all up some people get Parkinson's due to that so I think everybody uniquely has a different mixture of this and that's why every patient's different and every patient progresses differently so we've identified Paraquat as a potential disruptor, so I'm sure that's illegal everywhere in the world, right? No, absolutely not. It's actually still one of the most widely used herbicides in the world. We try to kill insects by destroying their nervous systems, but like, how can exposure to those chemicals be good for our nervous systems? Well, it can't be good for it, and it's likely bad for it. Paraquat is banned in the EU, Britain, China, India, Guatemala, Thailand. So a, a list of countries, but not including the United States and not including Canada. No, no. Uh, and in a 2016 New York Times article linking Paraquat to Parkinson's disease, in which Dr. Ritz is actually quoted, author Danny Hakem writes, The world's most popular weed killer is Monsanto's Roundup. Some 220 million pounds of its active ingredient were used last year in the United States, according to the EPA. But weeds are becoming resistant to Roundup, and Paraquat has been marketed as an alternative. Last year, 7 million pounds of Paraquat were used in the United States on nearly 15 million acres, unquote. Now, one sip, Nikki, one sip of Paraquat is a dosage that will be deadly for most humans. Whoa. Now, the company behind Paraquat, Syngenta, has long denied the connection to Parkinson's disease. Well, yeah, surprise, surprise there. I well, mean, not trying to sound too controversial. Our scientists but... aren't so quite sure. Jeez, how often have we heard that story yeah. over and over? But outside of the United States, I mean, here we're doing this broadcast out of Canada. Yeah. And... It's legal here, too? Yeah, in Canada, less than 50,000 uh, kilograms, or 110,000 pounds, are used to control aquatic weeds and weeds and seed crops in orchards, and as a harvest aid for soybeans. Okay, soybeans? That's soy milk, tofu, mm -hmm. miso, soy sauce, tempeh, teriyaki, breakfast cereals, cereal bars, whipped toppings. I mean, the mm, list goes paracot. on and on and on. Uh, additionally... Corn productivity increases the year immediately after soybeans have been grown in that field. You know what else is made with soybeans? What? AstroTurf, wood stain, paintballs for people who like to go paintballing, crayons, ink as well. Whoa, 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 whoa. So if, let's just say, uh, theoretically, I was a first grader who ate a lot of crayons. Yeah, I mean, not you specifically, no, I'm no, sure, no, but no. someone who looked a lot like you, Maybe okay. Maybe that could have triggered my <laughs> Parkinson's? Brilliant. Thank you, Paraquat. <laughs> Globally, it's re reportedly used on more than 100 crops, including apples and coffee and sugar cane. Uh, but even in countries who are banning it, uh, they don't have their hands clean of all this. In 2016, Britain exported Paraquat to Brazil and Colombia and Ecuador and Guatemala and India and Indonesia and Japan and Mexico and oh Panama and Singapore and South Africa and Taiwan and Uruguay and Venezuela. Okay, so they in don't addition want it. to the United States. Oh my goodness. Okay, so they don't want it in their own country. No, but you go to, you but can we'll have send it. it everywhere, including the United States. And China is still exporting it. 
There's got to be something that somebody can do to stop this madness. Well, in Canada, there have been many reviews by Health Canada. Good. And among the steps to protect human health is to reduce the concentration of the chemical in the single approved product. The, the one product that's been approved by Health Canada in this country. And it now has a closed transfer packaging system, which Health Canada has deemed safe. So what exactly does that mean? It's that means safer you'll during nev- transportation? nobody will ever touch the chemical. It's all in enclosed. So the workers are safer the as they're transporting the chemical. The workers are safe. The yes. chemical. Yes. Let's say safer. Maybe not safer. safer. Let's say safer yeah. in and, order to be safe. Yeah. And last July, in the U.S. House, uh, Representative Nadia Velazquez, a uh, Democrat of New York, introduced legislation to ban the Paraquat in the United States. It's never gone to committee. It has about a 3% chance of going before the full House and Senate and being passed. And the other problem, environmentally speaking, according to Dr. Bronstein, is President Trump. The current administration is not supportive of environmental research. In fact, they're opposite. They've, they've uh, basically waged war against environmental research. And so getting people to support research on what toxins are out there, what industry is doing in dumping toxins, not just for Parkinson's, but for many diseases. It ha- we have to increase the awareness. Regulations are there for a reason. And sometimes they're a good thing. They protect us. So we have to use smart regulations and, and uh, really advocate for that. Okay, I don't want to show my hand as far as my political com- opinions are concerned, so I'm going to skirt around the Trump conversation, but I will say this. Every government should be investing in research that can benefit the health of their population, period. Yeah, but they're not, so that's why private donations for research are so important. Michael J. Fox uh, famously said, I don't want a bigger slice of the pie, I want a bigger pie, and i 100% behind that. Yes, absolutely. And also, some of the research we are doing is really cutting edge and very daring, you know. And that is not necessarily something that the federal government wants to fund because it's high risk. And when you do high risk research, there might be a high payoff, but it's not necessarily uh, very certain in, in its outcome. Dr. Ritz mentioned something that I'm actually not familiar with, though, during this conversation. MPTP and instantaneous Parkinson's. Yeah, that was new to me, too. I've got some some stuff on this. It's going to blow your mind. Now, I'd not heard of this, but it is documented in the book, The Case of the Frozen Addicts. Neurosurgeon J. William Langston and writer John Palferman recount the bizarre and far-reaching mystery of six patients who arrived at a San Francisco area emergency room in 1982 after using a synthetic analog of heroin. Fully conscious but unable to move, unable to speak, they were soon diagnosed by Langston as having advanced Parkinson's disease. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah, so I'm going to read from the start of the book, okay? okay? George Carrillo knew something was wrong the moment he injected the heroin. His arm burned as if hot lead were flowing into his veins, giving him a stunning high, the best he'd had for years. Then he began to hallucinate strangely, trying to walk through doors that weren't there hurting himself each time he plowed into a wall. George vaguely wondered about those four bindles he'd bought on the street in the mountain view, but then he fell into an uncomfortable sleep. The next morning, George awoke feeling as if his body had turned to stone. His girlfriend, Juanita, was sleeping quietly on his shoulder, but when he tried to move his right arm, he couldn't. It was stuck, wrapped around her body. Juanita pried herself free and helped George out of bed. Everything George did that day happened in slow motion. Going to the bathroom, getting dressed, making breakfast. He had no desire to go out, but he had to show up in court or his parole would be revoked. If he failed to appear, he would be back in prison before the day was out. Moving with glacial speed, George struggled out of his old Volkswagen and drove to the courthouse on Julian Street. Wow. So... They had some wicked heroin and got Parkinson's disease? Yeah, that sums it up. I mean, it was permanent Parkinson's. I found some video of the patients being examined. Uh, It was posted on the website for the medical journal Lancet. Dr. Langston and associates are are taking patients through some of the same battery of tests I went through, but the patients are barely responding, barely moving. Uh, Here's an examination with patient number five. The tremor involves predominantly the upper extremities, but is also present uh, in his head 
uh, and uh, neck musculature. I think you can see it uh, in the jaw, and it also involved to some extent his tongue. The tremor has interfered uh, over the course of his illness significantly with his ability to swallow and speak. Toby, can you tell us how long you've had these symptoms? Two and a half months. In addition to the tremor, there are some other quite striking Parkinsonian features. I think it's uh, quite apparent that the patient is uh, not exhibiting the normal repertoire of small movements and adjustments that one normally makes. Okay, so then what happened? Well, they gave them levodopa. Oh. Because they're like, well, if they have Parkinson's, this should do something. And they awoke. Here's patient number one after having some levodopa. Was that uncomfortable? Was that painful? Or was it just like just couldn't move? What did that feel like? It wasn't painful. Mm-hmm. Physically. Mm-hmm. It was painful mentally. It was difficult mentally. Yes. Is that because you basically lost control? Or was there fear? Or what, what types of things were bothering you? Um, because I lost control because it was fear. I almost suffocated. So levodopa helped them. Yeah, all seven. All seven of all the patients. All seven patients. After a few months, however, five of them started getting dyskinesia. Oh, interesting. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Jeez. Fun. Okay, so are there any other factors that you should be considering as you try to figure out why you got Parkinson's? Because I am like a thousand percent confident that you have never done heroin. Never done any type of heroin, let alone the wicked type that gives you Parkinson's. Oh, my goodness. Okay, yeah. so. Uh, well, what else? it can happen to people after strokes. Oh. Do you think that perhaps you may have had a stroke that you've been aware of or not? No. No. You're no. confident in that. Okay, so that's off the list. Well, I have one for you. Okay. Have you ever lived near a major busy road? Mm, what, uh, huh? Okay. Hear me out. A new study from the University of British Columbia's School of Population and Public Health analyzed this huge data pool. They looked at 678 thousand adults between the ages of 45 and 84 years old living in the metro Vancouver area in British Columbia. And I actually talked to Professor Michael Brower about what he discovered. So what we found was that um, for people who live uh, close to a major road or a highway, there was an increased risk of developing dementia, um, Parkinson's disease, um, or Alzheimer's disease, and as well as MS. And then specifically for uh, dementia and Parkinson's disease, we saw also a link with air pollution. The positive side of it is that we also found that people who live uh, close to the areas where, which were greener, so more green spaces, um, that was actually reduced the effect of, of living close to a major road. So there's the benefit of being close to, close to nature. But it's thinking about it, I, 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 I can't recall ever living that close to a, like a major roadway, but you know, it also depends on how you define major, but I, I think we can cross that one off the list, but that's fascinating. Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? And I think the larger theme here is that they were looking at potentially, or maybe drawing a link to how potentially pollutants could be affecting people with Parkinson's or the development of Parkinson's. And just so you know, I did ask about the methodology because when I first heard this study, I thought, wait a minute, what if people with Parkinson's disease are just moving closer to homes that are next to major roadways so that they can get to the hospital easier if they have to or get to a doctor's appointment more easily. And he said, no, 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 they they looked at those factors as well and they were able to rule that kind of stuff out. The only link they could find was the location of the major roadway and then possibly pollutants as a result. So again, another environmental factor. Another environmental factor, exactly. So shall we continue <sighs> okay, with our checklist? Let's look at the board. <laughs> okay. Your mail, check. Yes, check. Something may have happened at birth. Check. Check. Your genome test showed no link to Parkinson's genes, but more genes are still being found. So we'll maybe put that down as a maybe. Sure. Alpha synuclein plays some role, but we're not too sure what yet. So, so maybe another maybe. Maybe another maybe. Uh, no head trauma. Correct. So we can cross that off the list. Chemicals? Uh, no. Okay, so you probably weren't exposed to more than, say, the average kid. Yeah, just the off and whatnot. Exactly, okay, and that stuff that was sprayed on your lawn. But as the doctor said, it can be triggered by a couple different factors, and it's different for everybody. Yeah, yeah, and Dr. Ritz elaborates on that a bit here. 
We have shown that in the in our study in the Central Valley that combinations of different risk factors actually increase your risk additively or multiplicatively. So you have a higher risk if, if several factors come together. And then from a preventive point of view, uh, if you're saying, well, I need two factors, so which one should I take away so I don't get it, right? And so you have a choice. You either don't get your head trauma or you move away from pesticide applications. Oh my goodness, Larry, this disease is infuriating. Tell me about it. Like how many things have we looked at here I'll tell you, I don't know why you got Parkinson's. Well, you know what I think? I think it's connected to inflammation, Mm. uh, which has been induced by stress. Right. I have met a lot of people, a lot of successful people, a lot of people with high-stress jobs that have a lot of travel, a lot of deadlines, workaholics, uh, type A personalities, who are now dealing with Parkinson's disease. Hmm. Uh, and I don't think that's a coincidence. And we all kind of have this theory, uh, those of us that are kind of of this ilk, where we we work too much and we, we have high stress and lots of travel. We're like, I think that threw my body into some sort of fight or flight and triggered something to trigger the Parkinson's and inflammation. They talk about, you know, the gut biome and the inflammation in the brain and how it all right. sort of melds together. Uh, and so I wouldn't be surprised if they found that, that some Parkinson's, including mine, is triggered that way. Uh, I talked to Dr. Malou Tanzi from the University of Florida about this at the Parkinson's IQ Plus U event in Atlanta. We're very interested in the sort of environmental piece that inflammation and chronic inflammatory diseases could be doing to increase risk and to increase progression. So you talk about inflammation, you can get that in a number of different ways. Stress is one of them. Uh, You talked about it on stage. What role are we learning that stress plays in Parkinson's? Yes, stress is a bad player. Stress tends to immunosuppress you. Stress tends to um, create um, a situation in your body where all the normal pathways are basically basically slowing down and they become sluggish. So we think that even removal of alpha-synuclein and other toxic species from your brain um, is uh, critical and that stress really dampens those down. So does lack of sleep. And so it's important to manage the stress in your life, especially with a regular uh, regimen of exercise. Exercise, though. Again, we hear about the importance of exercise. And when we talk about You hear that, but I don't... <laughs> are you boy, not listening to this? <laughs> well, because if we are talking about inflammation potentially causing or being a, a link to Parkinson's, inflammation uh, can be reduced by exercise. It can be. And obesity is a cause of inflammation. And I am overweight. Inflammation can be caused by stress, as you also said, though, and you are stressed out. I'm um, that, too. <laughs> And who doesn't have stress, to be honest? Uh, Like, maybe I'm not overweight. Maybe I'm just inflamed. (laughs) That's a really nice way to put it. Oh, I'm feeling a little inflamed. Stress isn't quite fitting right. (laughs) Uh, So, I, I, you know, I know it's not like a proven theory or there's been no studies that I'm aware of on the high stress job causing inflammation to trigger Parkinson's. But for me, it resonates. It's a common theme I found. Mm. You know, aren't we just full of maybes? Possiblies, could be's. <laughs> yeah, I think that we're left with as much uh, uncertainty as as we could possibly get. <laughs> okay, so Larry, how did you get Parkinson's? I don't know. <laughs> hey, Nikki. Yeah. Uh, can, can you come back here for a sec? Okay. Well, just give me a sec to sit down. Uh, uh, hey. Welcome back. So uh, we're, we're, we're doing the podcast of, about why did I get Parkinson's? How did mm-hmm. I get Parkinson's? What's up? Yeah. Uh, so since we last spoke, some brand new research has come up. Breaking news here. Uh, brand new research out of Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, California, suggests people with young onset Parkinson's, that's me, may be born with damaged brain cells. Really? Yes. So researchers took special stem cells uh, from YOPD patients and figured out a way to rewind the cells to exactly how they were in the embryonic state. Wow. It's like time travel. This, <laughs> it's, Of course, it's 2020. We were expecting time travel. Right. We got it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this technique gave researchers a window back in time to see how well dopamine neurons might have functioned from the very start of a patient's life. And the researchers found two key abnormalities. They spotted an accumulation of alpha synuclein. 
Interesting. There is our alpha synuclein yeah, again. Yep. They also notice malfunctioning lysosomes. Now, have you ever heard of lysosomes? Uh, maybe not since like biology class. Okay, so these are cell structures that are like trash cans for the cell to break down and dispose of proteins. Now, this malfunction could cause alpha synuclein to build up because it's not throwing away the protein. Oh, interesting. So, where do we go from here? <laughs> well, if this is legit, then it sounds to me like you could have been born with it. Like this resonates with me more than anything else. Like when I when I read this research, I, I almost started crying, Nikki. Really? Because I you well, how frustrating was it to go through that list of stuff? Yeah. And, and, and talk about all the things that could be like, no, nah, it's not chemicals, it's not this, it's not this makes sense to me. That what if like uh, you talk about my mom thought it was a birth. Right, because she didn't have oxygen. Right, birth. I was born chin first. So yeah. maybe maybe there was already movement disorder. Maybe I couldn't get, as, an, as, as, a, as a fetus, I couldn't get in the right position because my, my brain cells were already malfunctioning. Oh, interesting stuff. Wow, you know, that really does give some hope. I didn't realize how much I was... Asking myself, what did I do? Uh, And if this is the answer, I didn't do anything. That can be a really dark path to go down when you blame yourself. I know. And I didn't know I was doing it until I read this article. And I felt all this relief lift off my shoulders. Uh, And maybe maybe I want to believe it so it's not my fault. But it, it rings true to me. Well, I certainly hope that we hear more about this research and we hear more about new research that explains the origins of Parkinson's disease to give other people hope and, like yourself, to make them not feel so bad about where their Parkinson's came from. Each week, we check in with Larry and his wife, Rebecca. I thought it was funny, honey, when um, Nikki was asking you about, have you ever lived close to a... A busy road or or intersection or mm-hmm. or something and you said no and he, do you remember we used to live we could hear and see the 210 highway from our house when we lived in Tahunga, california and he, <laughs> <laughs> so if you add up all the check marks right. <laughs> i've got about five possible things right so um, that uh, increases your chances of getting Parkinson's. So, hey, hey, look at me. I'm like a lottery winner. Why is it important to you to find out why you have Parkinson's? I need to know it's not my fault. Because mm. I, I feel like I've burdened everybody in my family and in my life with this. And if it's not my fault, then I didn't do it. Well, even if it was something that you could have controlled back in the day. How does that change things? It just makes me more feel more guilty. (laughs) Well, that's helpful. (laughs) So I'm trying to to prove the other the other one. Well, because chances are, honey, that it's even if it is something like that, and we don't know what it is, even if it is something like that, you can't go back and change it. I know, but I want to know. I just it's just so freaky. This disease just confounds me, and I just want to know something about it. And we don't know uh, uh, much at all. Where did you come up with the title for the podcast, When Life Gives You Parkinson's? Well, when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. I guess I just find that curious, because you were wise enough to see a little bit of the bigger picture when you titled the podcast very early in your journey, when you didn't know most of the people that you know now from the community and explored a lot of the ideas that you've explored. Well, that's the part we haven't talked about, which is why did I get Parkinson's? Maybe to tell my story and to advocate and to empower others. That's what I was trying to get you to. (laughs) (laughs) Well... I do feel like I'm in a privileged position, um, but the reality of it is that I wanted to listen to this podcast. I didn't want to have to do it, Yeah. but it didn't exist. When it's just you and you're sitting in a room or you're meditating or contemplating, what lessons just for you personally in your own journey, what has Parkinson's 
been a catalyst for or shown you or shown a spotlight on and you're still moving through it? I think the biggest lesson is we work so hard in order to get the money to do the things we want to do, but we never stop to do the things that we want to do. We just keep working. And you have to make that time. I think the other thing is we don't always appreciate all the people in our life who do support us, support us even if we're not in touch, even if we're not regularly talking. You, you forget the, the mark you've made in people's lives over the course of many, 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 many years until something goes awry and then they're there. And you're like, whoa, I forgot. So it's appreciating everything you've built over the course of your life. And we don't take time to do that. We don't have time to do that. Life's too busy and too fast. And so slowing down is another lesson of just allowing yourself to to just walk slow and see the world and not rush through it. Why do you think I got Parkinson's? My personal philosophy is that we are given the challenges that we're ready for that teach us the lessons that we need to learn. This just happens to be a really big challenge. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, and you, you think about all the decisions that I had to make growing up in order to get in the position to be ready to have the onset of Parkinson's. Right. <laughs> I right. mean, and if you've had it since you were born, right. which is the new theory for YOPD, then you've been preparing all along. It's, Just it, to be able to tell the story at the right time. It's almost like an alien was born with me in my body, like, okay, when you're ready, I'm going to hatch. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Henry's here now. Why do you think I got Parkinson's? Uh, I think he started it as a, as a little kid, and I maybe, like, if the Parkinson's not go away might die with it too I think I will probably die with it I don't think it's going to go away I don't think it's not going to go away no I love you I love you too we also want to hear from you you can record a voice message for us at speakpipe.com slash when life gives you Parkinson's like Melanie did Larry this one's for you Hi, my name is Melanie. I'm in central Massachusetts, and I'm an occupational therapy practitioner. I found your podcast a little over a year ago when I started working with more Parkinson's patients in an outpatient clinic, and sharing your podcast with them um, so they can kind of follow along the journey that you've been on. Uh, it's hard as a practitioner to to articulate what might be coming. Um, and I feel like everything is from, I've learned is from the clinical side and not the patient side. So I thank you for sharing your story so that I can share it with others and so that may, they may learn and, and benefit from your knowledge. Appreciate um, all you've done for Parkinson's and bringing awareness um, to to it. I find the actually the Canadian Parkinson's um, website much more beneficial than the U.S. one. And in fact, we refer patients there a lot just for information. And I'd be curious just to know how occupational therapy may have helped you and what occupational therapy could do uh, more of. What, what can we help you guys with? I'd be very interested in learning that because I would like to... Um, to share it with my patients. Um, so thank you very much, Larry, and uh, have a good night. Thanks. Bye. Oh, thanks, Melanie. Uh, and thanks for the call. I'm sure Parkinson Canada will be happy to hear this too. Uh, occupational therapy uh, has introduced me to uh, bigger, fatter pens for better, easier handwriting, uh, voice to text programs for phone and computer. Uh, we, we, you know, Nikki, we should actually do a full episode on OTs. Mm. Uh, I feel like they're like kind of lumped in with PTs and why they work hand in hand. They, they really have different expertise. Uh, so, so why don't we do this? If, if you have a good occupational therapy story or are an OT with yeah. a good Parkinson story, tell us about it. I would love to hear from occupational therapists on this show. Tell us your experience working with Parkinson's patients. Speakpipe.com slash when life gives you Parkinson's. Next time on When Life Gives You Parkinson's. 
There'd be commandos in the trees and wars on the other side of the uh, complex where I live. Just crazy things. I don't even know how to process that. My husband had Parkinson's and Lewy body dementia. It sucks. Do you find by encouraging other uh, caregivers to, to write write down their thoughts and feelings and observations it's helpful i think it's helpful for everybody to keep a diary or a um, journal wrote the book because i thought it was my way to give back find meaning out of all this uh craziness I used to say i was very happy being a cold-hearted bitch like i was just <laughs> i was very happy with that life but now i'm a way better person something that you could laugh and use humor with and so i thought that i have always been kind of perky so that just seems like a good fit perky perky the guys tend to get this belief that they're lazy and the women tend to feel like they're not good enough doing good enough they're a burden so what's what's the what's the answer you eat lots of chocolate see i love you <laughs> This is When Life Gives You Parkinson's, a Curious Cast podcast. Our presenting partner is Parkinson Canada, parkinson.ca. One of the programs Parkinson Canada offers is a confidential information and referral line. So if you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to reach out to info at parkinson.ca or call toll-free 1-800-565-3000. Parkinson Canada colleagues are there for you. They're great listeners and can answer questions on a huge range of topics. Special thanks also to our promotional partners, Spotlight YOPD. Now, that's the only organization in the world with the singular focus of raising awareness of young onset Parkinson's disease. And you can find them at spotlightyopd.org. And also in the U.S., the Parkinson's IQ Plus U Tour. This is a free series, Parkinson's events from the Michael J. Fox Foundation to educate and empower people with Parkinson's and their partners. For more information, go to michaeljfox.org slash PDIQ. And thank you for listening. Please take a moment to subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, CastBox, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And while you're there, give the show a five-star rating and please share in the comments why you recommend listening to this podcast. You can also engage with us on social media at Parkinson's Pod on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, or email us Parkinson's Pod at CuriousCast.com. Thank you also to our special guests, Dr. Jeff Bronstein, Dr. Bietta Ritz, Dr. Balu Tanzi, Dr. Matt Ferrer, Marty Gifford, and Rebecca Gifford. If you're interested in learning more about genetics, check out Season 1, Episode 8, The Search for a Cure, starts with fundraising. When Life Gives You Parkinson's is hosted and produced by me, Larry Gifford, and Nikki Reitmeyer. Our story producer is Dila Velazquez, and sound design by Rob Johnston. Keep positive. Keep exercising. Keep listening. We'll talk to you next time. Canada may be known for its landscapes and friendly people, but beneath the surface lies a darker side of crime, history, and the paranormal. Since 2017, the award-winning Dark Poutine podcast has explored the shadowy corners of the Great White North and beyond, delivering chilling tales from a uniquely Canadian perspective. Hosted by Mike Brown and Matthew Stockton with over 300 episodes and fresh releases every Monday, Dark Poutine is your weekly ticket to the creepier side of Canada. Listen to Dark Poutine on Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you get your podcasts.